Hi, I'm Susan Wise Bauer, co author of The Well Trained Mind. And I'm Susanna Jarrett, editor at The Well Trained Mind Press. And we're talking about education for all parents and for all children in all sorts of settings. So, today, I'm very excited about today because we're going to be talking about modeling and copying. And we're going to take a little sort of detour at the end and talk about memorization as well. These are such critical learning tools for a classical education, but I feel that they're, they're, um, they're often misunderstood and sometimes even scorned and condemned. So let's talk about modeling, copying, and then eventually memorization and why they're important and most importantly for me, why they're an essential part of becoming a creative and critical thinker. So Suzanne, you want to talk a little bit about modeling and how we learn? Yeah, for sure. It is it is crazy that they've kind of become out of vogue because for so long, modeling is just how human beings have learned things. If you think about a young child, they're learning behaviors by doing what their parents do, memorizing what their parents say, copying it back, trying out what they've heard mm -hmm. around them. And then when you think about just learning life skills, even beyond academics, if you want to go paint a room, you could read a book about how to paint a room, you but could. it's going to be a lot easier if you watch somebody do it, do it with them, try it out a few times. My husband and I thought in our new house that we could learn to paint a room without a model. How hard could it be, right? You just slap some paint on the wall. It looked horrible. <laughs> but when the painter came and we were to watch him do it, it was such a different story. It, it makes the biggest difference to watch someone do something. Well, isn't this why YouTube has become such a phenomenon in terms of learning how to do something? Because great reading instructions is great, but you can watch someone do it. And that makes right. all the difference. And and I mean, I will say also, so like coming at this from a completely different direction, I live on a farm. We have livestock. We have horses. Right now we have a brand new baby foal. He's three months old and Aww. every he's, he's gorgeous. Everything that he learns how to do, he learns by watching his mother. So he has just now started to have his own breakfast in his own stall all by himself. And the reason why he will walk in the stall and put his nose down into the feed bin is because he watches his mother do it every single day. So that is how we learn to do new things is watching other people do them. Right. And even academically for thousands of years, people have learned through examining models and copying them. Mm -hmm. If you look at the writings of Shakespeare and St. Augustine, mm -hmm. you'll see that they're infused with the rhythm and the themes and ideas of great works that went before them. And their biographers tell us that they mastered their own language and they are, you know, some of the greatest writers or most influential writers rather in history, but they mastered their language by copying things that came before. Well, and I think this is where it is really useful to talk about the differences between real life practical skills and academic work. So in real life, if you're learning social skills, if you're learning to you know, paint a room or eat out of your feed bin all by yourself, all you have to do is watch somebody else do it. But when we're talking about academic work, what other people are doing is not live right? It's not happening right. in front of us. It is in books. It's in writing. It is in what they have set down. And so the way to quote unquote, watch that, the way for that to become real to us is to copy it out. So when you're talking about academics and looking at written words in particular, copying is the equivalent of watching a YouTube video. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. And one thing that we learned when I was be training to become a teacher is that you can never expect your students to do something without modeling it first. Mm -hmm. Because when you try, whether it's modeling it through writing it down, if it's if it's academic or modeling it by doing it on the board, you're going to end up frustrated and your students are going to end up frustrated because they can't do something without seeing it done. We're all wired that way. And so one thing that I learned in, in teaching school that I've always thought was a helpful little tip is I do, we do, you do. So mm -hmm. with students, first you do it and you talk out loud and, and think out loud as you're oh, doing something. And let me mm -hmm. interrupt you. That is so important important. I think particularly if we are academic types ourselves, mm -hmm. we tend to let that process kind of get stuck inside of our heads. You have to become much more verbal. If you're working through a new skill with a student, you have to do it yourself and talk about 
what you're right. doing so they can hear you. Right. And and someone who can is really good at doing something, let's say you're just amazing at advanced math, but if you don't know how to verbalize that and talk through your process, it's going to be really hard for you to teach someone who's learning that topic. My husband is a plumber and he learned plumbing in the last three years. And working with plumbers who talk out loud while they're doing stuff was so much easier for him than someone who's just so good. They did do, 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 do. And yeah. what just happened? You know, yes. so talk, <laughs> learning to talk out loud is one of the best ways to improve being a teacher because you're learning how to even tell yourself how you do it because you might do it without thinking about it because you've done it so many times. And I would say that the better you are at something, the more natural something is to you, the more gifted you are at it, the more important it is to break it down right. and talk about what you're doing because you cannot assume that whoever you're teaching, which is for most of you is probably your kids, is going to take that in in the same way and process it in the same way. Absolutely. So that's critical step number one. And then once you have talked it out, you've done your I do, then you move to we do. Let's do this together. Let's mm -hmm. let me hold your hand and we're going to do an example together. And maybe you do one, maybe you do two, maybe you do five, depending on, you know, how the student is doing. And then once they're ready, then they do the I do. I do, we do, you do. Now they're on their own and they can do it solo. And that's when they've mastered it because they've seen you do it and they've done it with you a few times. And a very, a very practical suggestion for the second step that we do mm -hmm. is to alternate. So you start out and say, mm -hmm. so here's your, say you're solving a problem. Here's my first step. You're doing a long division problem. I'm going to draw my little, what is that thing called? The, like the long, you know what I mean? The long division, like the the upright and then the thing across. I'm sure it has. Right. I, it's been lost. Well, anyway, to me you know what I'm talking about. So the first thing right. you're going to do is you're going to draw it and you're going to put the number that you're dividing and the number that you're dividing into it. And you're going to say, I just set this problem up. Now, what's the next step? Do the just the next step mm -hmm. and then alternate back and forth like that. Don't just wait for the kid to come up with the first step because that's not modeling. That's a great idea. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So we were talking about copying and modeling. And I think one really great example of how this works, even specifically in the classical progression is teaching writing. And I know you have a lot of thoughts about teaching writing with copying and modeling. So I'd love to get your ideas on how you can use that to get into proper instruction of writing. Sure. Well, I will, uh, I will attempt not to now deliver a two hour lecture on the teaching of writing. If you wish <laughs> to hear that, we actually have workshops at welltrainedmind.com. Um, but here we want to talk a little bit more generally about the value of modeling mm -hmm. and of copy work, which, as I say, is like watching the model. That's the that's the academic version of watching your YouTube video. I'll just start with a really quick example from American history, which is the example of Benjamin Franklin. Benjamin Franklin, great American hero. Not one of my favorite people. Really sketchy <laughs> private life. Very arrogant, very odd ideas about how easy it is to lead a perfect life. But for the moment, let us set that aside and just talk about Benjamin Franklin, the writer, because what is indisputable is that without almost without formal education, with very little formal training, Benjamin Franklin trained himself to become an engaging articulate, accomplished writer. Mm -hmm. And the way that he did this, he explains in his autobiography, is that he copied out articles in the newspapers of the day. And in, in those days, newspapers were much more like thought journals. You know, they, they weren't really like Facebook or Twitter news. They were actually thought pieces. He would take a piece and he would copy it out. And in that copying, he would start to come to an understanding of why the writer arranged a topic in a certain way, why a writer used certain vocabulary, why a writer chose to end in a particular place. Really, he started to get an intuitive understanding of why a piece of writing worked by copying it out. Then what he would do, I love this part. I actually, I, I used to assign this to my freshman composition students when I was teaching at William & Mary. Then he would cut the copy apart. He would cut apart the essay that he'd written and basically shake it all up in a hat oh, and, then, wow. and then see if he could put it back together in order. Mm. And when he could, he found that he, again, was understanding why the arrangement of ideas was as it was. Sometimes- mm -hmm. 
This is very Benjamin Franklin. Sometimes he said, I found a better arrangement. (laughs) And and (laughs) my arrangement turned out to be better than the original. But the point here is that he's not just creating from scratch. He is working with material that is produced by another accomplished writer in order to learn from them. And then after that, his last step in the process is he would take the main points throw all the other stuff out, take the main points and write his own essay on the same topic using the same main points. And then he would compare it to the original. Wow. And right there, you can see whether he was trying to or not the classical progression. Step one, internalizing, memorizing, copying that language, that rhythm. Step two, organizing, learning how to mm-hmm. to organize information. And then step three, clear original composition. That's yeah, amazing. Ex- exactly. And Franklin being Franklin, he was like, mine was usually better than the original. <laughs> um, so there's a wonderful professor of rhetoric, Gideon Burton, and we'll put a link to his website in our show notes, who has done just wonderful work explaining that, particularly in the Renaissance, and we've talked about this in earlier episodes, the Renaissance was really the flowering of what we now talk about as classical education. In the Renaissance, creativity was not the first goal. Creativity and self-expression came way down the line. In the Renaissance, scholars spent their formative years copying out the work of other scholars so that they could figure out what to do and how to do it and how this was what laid the foundation for their later creativity because, you know, they were assembling all of these tools in their minds so that they could then use those to write original works. Wow. That's fascinating. Yeah. I mean, if I could just go sideways from Renaissance literature to riding a horse again for a moment, Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) I'm training two young horses right now. So training is very much on my mind. A few weeks ago, when I went to take my regular riding lesson with my coach, who's a very well-known, extremely accomplished, internationally ranked judge, she said, Today, we're going to ride together. And she brought out her internationally trained Grand Prix horse and said, "Okay, when you do a shoulder in, watch what I'm doing. Do you see what the horse is doing? Now, I'm going to this was actually a little bit shaming. Now, I'm going to do what you do (laughs) when you Uh do a shoulder in. Right. (laughs) And she would demonstrate it. And I could immediately see, you know, my left arm sticks out and then that throws the horse off balance. Watching her do that just immediately Mm. catapulted me forward a whole level in what I was trying to do with the horse and gave me the freedom to work with my own horse um, in a way that allowed us to both express ourselves. Uh, Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's just sort of like a a real life example of how useful modeling can be because she stood on the ground for weeks and yelled at me. Right. (laughs) Right. And told me what to do. And I understood what she was saying intellectually, but watching Mm -hmm. her do it, that made all the difference. So even turning around and modeling what your student is doing can help them see the difference. Yes, exactly. Sometimes sometimes modeling what they're doing that's wrong mm-hmm. <laughs> can even be helpful. Yeah. Okay. So sorry, we got distracted there because we were going to talk about right. writing. And I started talking about Benjamin Franklin and then I started talking about dressage lessons. But okay, so let's get back to writing. So you talk about writing a lot in your in your lectures and in, in your writing. Mm-hmm. And you've mentioned before how you've seen firsthand by teaching freshmen in college that the way that we teach writing doesn't work. What about it doesn't work? Well, right now, schools and actually a lot of a lot of homeschool writing programs too tend to work on more of an what's called an inspirational model. Mm-hmm. It treats writing like talking. That if you have something that you really want to say, you'll figure out what words to put to it and you'll be able to say it. In writing, that translates to give the students, this is an actual quote from a writing curriculum that I reviewed, give the students high interest subjects and then just have them write and write and write and write and write. That was like the extent of the (laughs) instruction as to how the students were supposed to write. There are two problems with this. One is that this assumes that all students will be able to figure out the writing process on their own. And by the Mm -hmm. writing process, I'm just talking about the most basic, take words, put them in sentences, get those sentences down on paper. The assumption is that every student can figure this out eventually. Mm -hmm. And what we see, I think, in 
the education world more widely is that some of them can figure it out, but there are a lot who can't because writing is not like speaking. Speaking is a natural human impulse. You know, if you're not suffering from an organic difficulty, if a child is spoken to, they will learn how to speak. Mm -hmm. But just because a child reads or is read to does not necessarily mean that they will be able to figure out how to write. That's because speaking is natural and writing is artificial. I mean, we survived for many, many years, years, centuries, millennia, probably, without ever having right. to write anything down. It's not it, it came writing came about with civilization because we needed to do better record keeping. So if a student is going to need learn how to write, most of them are going to need you to say, do A, do B, do C, do D. After you've learned how to do A, B, C, and D, let's talk about the rest of the alphabet. And then let's talk about how to put that together into words. It's something that mm -hmm. they need to be explicitly taught. They're not just going to absorb it naturally in most cases. So how do we teach that? Well, the way you don't teach it is just to give young students longer and longer and more complicated assignments and just tell them to stick to it until they figure it out. That's not modeling. Mm -hmm. Right. So then how can we infuse copying and modeling into a writing education in order to make it easier for students to pick up something that is so unnatural? Yeah. Well, there are, of course, as with all things in education, more than one way to do this. I, I would say um, to parents in particular who are working with students, there are students who pick up writing sort of intuitively. And if that's the case, you're super lucky. And if everything is going fine, don't change what you're doing. But if you have what I think are the majority of kids, a kid that says, this is, <laughs> this is the number one thing they say, I can't think of anything to write about. <laughs> right. What they're really saying is, I don't know how to get into this task. I just, I don't uh -huh. know how to start. Then you need to give them a model. So the way in the grammar stage and the elementary years that I would make use of modeling and copy work is, and I'm going to give you one more caveat, if you've got one of those kids that started writing stories when she was five years old and goes off in the corner and comes back with a finished novella illustrated with colored pencils with a cover and a title, then they've already she's already got it, okay? You don't need to listen to what I'm about to say. But if you've got... One of the other kids who hates writing and maybe even cries when you bring out the writing curricula, then what you've got to remember is that writing has two aspects to it. First, you've got to take this inarticulate idea and you've got to put it in words. And then you've got to take these words and you've got to put the words down on paper. And before you can move forward with writing, being creative, being original, doing all that great stuff, somebody's got to model for you how to do that. So what we suggest is that the way you use this modeling and copy work framework for beginning writers is that first of all, you spend the first couple of years of their writing doing copy work, like literally mm -hmm. putting a sentence in front of them and having them copy it down so that they get the practice of actually putting words down on paper without the pressure of having to come up with the words at the same time. And then at other points in the curricula, in history and science or in literature, you practice narration which is where the student has read something, you've talked about something, and you ask the student to put into words, their own words, what you've just read. And as they say it, narrate it, you write it down for them. Notice the copy aspects here mm -hmm. in terms of the writing. They're, they are literally copying in order to master this task of putting words down on paper. In narration, they are copying in that they are using somebody else's ideas so they can really concentrate on just putting things into words. And then you are modeling by sort of performing the second half of that writing task for them. Remember, the writing task is put an idea into words, put the words down on paper. They're putting the idea into words. They're watching you put the words down on paper. So you're modeling that second part of the process for them. So the benefits of all of this, and, and we have much more on this topic at welltrainmind.com, um, how dictation fits into it. So we don't need to go into all of that right now. But what you as the parent need to remember 
is, or parent teacher, is that you are allowing them to develop these basic skills that will then Mm -hmm. allow them to express themselves. You're not cutting off creativity. You are not squelching creativity. You are enabling creativity. And that is the goal of the copy work and of the modeling. Right. And I think that's so important to remember in that we think about modeling. Oh, it's it's not, it's more than just rote. It's more than just parrot. It is like you said, giving them the tools, even from the physical tools, little kids are still developing their their hand muscles, like you yeah. point out in the well-trained mind, giving them the physical tools, giving them the mental tools, giving them the vocabulary and spelling, giving them absorbing the rules of grammar and style and the great sentences that they're writing down, exposing them to stories. It's such an efficient way to equip them to be creative thinkers and creative writers, if that's something that they're interested in Mm -hmm. down the line. Yeah, exactly. And then as we move on into middle school, so, and again, we don't have to get too hung up on all of the minutia of teaching Mm -hmm. writing as such, because we're really just using writing as an example of how modeling and copy work can lead to creativity rather than squelching creativity. When you move on into the logic stage, students have, by this point, we hope, learned how to put ideas into words without difficulty, but they've got to be able to to organize their thoughts. They've got to be able to Mm -hmm. logically structure an argument or a narrative or, you know, whatever it is they're writing. And so this, again, goes back to the Benjamin Franklin method. Before we ask them to write original essays or to construct arguments, what we do is we have them outline other essays, other people's Mm -hmm. writing, other narrative structures. We have them look at what other writers have done, analyze it. An outline is simply drawing a diagram of somebody else's ideas. And then we ask them, when appropriate, to rewrite those essays or those paragraphs of narrative, you know, whatever reasonably sized chunk you've chosen from that outline. Here again, we're showing them what it looks like to develop an argument instead of just asking them to do it from scratch. Right. I had a student once who posed that very question you mentioned a minute ago. What am I supposed to write about? He was in middle school, super smart, super talented, hated writing. Mm -hmm. And at first I thought, well, let's just make it more fun. You can write about anything. You can write about your favorite movie character. You can write about your favorite video game. But the more open-ended the assignments were, Mm -hmm. the more he struggled. He needed needed scaffolds, not freedom. So when I finally switched to talking to him about writing like programming, we're going to program this essay by filling in this outline with all the necessary things you need in an essay. That's when it finally clicked for him. And it because I'm more of a creative person, it ha- it was an adjustment for me to think, oh, he doesn't want a funner prompt. He wants scaffolds and models and outlining. And then once he's done that a few times, he can see a blank page and not be utterly overwhelmed by it. So I think as, as a parent teacher, mm-hmm. one of the things for you to be really alert to are signs of frustration from your student. A frustration when a student is being asked to do something that First of all, they don't have such a natural aptitude for that they can, you know, figure it out on their own and jump right in. And then second, they just haven't been given enough training in so that they don't know Mm -hmm. what to do. They haven't been given enough modeling. You're going to see this as frustration and Mm -hmm. frustration is largely nonverbal or at least it's not directly verb. If it's verbal, it's not directly related to the task at hand. So if you, if you give the child, you know, you're working through your curriculum, you give this child this assignment and their reaction is consistently, I hate this. I hate this. I hate this subject. I hate it. Well, that's actually nonverbal. I mean, I know they're saying words, <laughs> right? But they're, but they're not saying what they really mean, which is I don't have the tools to do this task mm-hmm. and I'm frustrated. And the reason why they can't say that is because they're not mature enough. They don't know. They don't know why they're frustrated. They just know that they're frustrated. And almost always that's because they are being given a task that has not been sufficiently modeled for them. I hate this. I'm stupid. You know, 
School is stupid. Mm -hmm. I'm never going to use this subject. All of those are expressions of frustration that are pointing you towards that problem, as are actual nonverbal behaviors such as, you know, dropping your pencil on the floor eight million times, Mm -hmm. um, poking holes in the paper with the pencil, throwing pencils, you know, anything like that that is showing this exasperation. Don't go directly to there's something wrong with this kid. I got to figure it out. First place Mm -hmm. you go is this curriculum or this program or this method is not modeling. They don't know what to do. Mm, That's such an important insight because sometimes kids don't have, they don't have the language to say, this is the expert book. How could the expert book be wrong? But exactly. But you know, they're really frustrated. That's such an important point. But let's look finally at what this copying and modeling looks like moving into the final stage or the rhetoric stage. Mm -hmm. Well, once you get to the rhetoric stage, Now you're at the point where the student can start to put all those models to use. They've learned through modeling how to get words down on paper. They've learned through modeling how to organize ideas. Now, as they move on into the rhetoric stage, because of all that modeling and copy work, they've been given a toolbox that they can draw on so that when they're then given a topic, you know, write about, write about Henry VIII and his wives or, you know, write about, write about the Japanese warlords and how they did and didn't exercise authority and how the people around them, their, their feudal subjects understood that, then they've got already in their minds, they've got all of these different ways that authors have dealt with similar problems, similar issues that they can draw on and start to use in order to develop their ideas. And my my constant my constant criticism of most writing programs is that they start out asking students to do rhetoric level work in the elementary grades. Mm-hmm. and in the middle grades. And they don't take the time in what we would think of as grades one through eight to give students a chance to copy so that, right, it's not that we're going to keep them copying, so that when they get into those high school years, they're all filled up with tools and information and turns of phrase and dates and techniques and all of this stuff from an educator point of view. I don't want a college freshman coming in who's been encouraged to be self-expressive since first grade because then you're kind of like, oh, I'm going to have to break down your cerebral cortex and teach you how this really works. (laughs) Um, Right. So that as an educator, that's my perspective. I'd much rather they just they did a whole bunch of copy work and modeling and Mm -hmm. then they come in ready to, you know, really put those to, to use. I know that as a parent, you can start to panic if you feel like your kid is not doing enough original quote unquote work and particularly accomplished parents. And I would say particularly accomplished parents of oldest children (laughs) uh, push those kids far too early to do advanced work Mm. and don't have the patience and the confidence. and, And I mean, why would you? You've never done this before. Don't have the patience and confidence to let them, I don't know, I was going to say stew in their own juices, um, <laughs> marinate, <laughs> you know, right? really soak in information and give it time to become part of how the kid thinks so that as they move into the high school years, they can start to exercise this. Right. It can be hard if, you know, the second grader across the street is writing a research paper and you're still copying sentences and modeling sentences, but it is such a step-by-step process. And we know the way that we do it more traditionally, isn't producing great writers um, on a regular basis. It's hard for a lot of students. So it's, it's hard. The comparison game is a really hard one, but I do really appreciate when you do get to that rhetoric stage, even then you're not necessarily, you don't necessarily have to have your high school student write tons and tons of really long papers, even then practicing these new rhetorical skills with short papers can be super helpful as well. So you have to cut the comparison game to practice these things that are going to be so much easier for your student and less frustrating for your student and build towards a step-by-step way to build towards a great writer. And when I'm doing workshops, I always point out to parents that every time you write a paper, you have to come up with a beginning, a middle, and an end. Mm Mm-hmm. And that's the hardest part. So it's much better to do that 15 times with two page papers than to write, Mm -hmm. you know, two longer papers. Right. 
Yeah. I remember in college, I had this one class and the professor was quite kind of quirky. She'd take her shoes off in the middle of class. Sometimes she wouldn't come and would like assign a random student to run it. And we never really knew what was happening. But the very like first day, the very first day she asked us, how do you know what you know? Can you tell me like an idea that you believe? And then the source. Can anyone give me one source for an idea they believe? And none of us could. I, I tried. Oh, I was like, well, I think I read this one book and that's where I got my idea about nations. But she was like, nope, wrong author. You you met this guy. And, and then throughout the semester, she made us write two very short papers a week responding to a dense article that we read. And that class was where I learned not just to write, but also to read because in writing a one page paper, kind of summarizing the idea of this long article, I had to really learn how to read dense academic work. And by the end of it, I had practiced condensing these ideas into short summaries with a beginning, a middle and an end. Mm -hmm. And finally, I, I could say, you know, I read this person's idea about nationhood and this person's idea of nationhood. And I agree with this and I don't agree with that. But I had a framework of ideas and of authors that I could play with. And I could really, I was really coming into the, a conversation about, it was an anthropology class about anthropology with much more basis. So those short papers were so, so helpful mm -hmm. to building the framework I have now about the origins of anthropology or whatever it was mm -hmm. that class was. Yeah. And, and I, 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 that is the story you love to hear as a teacher, you know, it just really yeah. affirms that this is the way to really introduce students to new ways of thinking. I, I just a quick, quick side note in a lot of classical curriculum, there's this thing called the progenismata, which are essentially, this is a set of exercises based on Aristotelian principles that teach you how to write different forms. So you write a narrative, you write a comparison, you write a contrast, you write praise of somebody, you write blame of somebody. And for each one of these, you have a model and you model what you're doing after, you know, some classical author. The goal here is not that you learn how to write a narrative or that you learn how to write a comparison or a contrast or praise or blame, but that when you start to do your own original composition, you think to yourself, okay, here's my idea. You know how I can make this really clear? I can write a narrative about it, or mm -hmm. I, can, I can contrast it with another idea, or I can compare it to another idea, or I can praise someone who believed this idea and acted it out so that all of these, all of the different forms that you learn by modeling in the progymnismata become building blocks like Legos, mm -hmm. you know, that you can stick together in your own mm -hmm. original compositions. Now, I tend to think there, there's some really good programs out there that make use of the progymnismata. Our program, our writing with skill program uh, starts to introduce these in the middle grades. I tend to think that these are best from about sixth, seventh grade up just because before then, particularly in the elementary years, students are spending so much energy just learning how to write grammatically, which is mm -hmm. a complicated task. But that can be a wonderful tool as you move on into the high school years. Awesome. So we've, we've been talking about modeling, how important that is in the educational process. And I've spent a lot of time talking about copy work and writing down different ways of summarizing and copying written work. But I, I think this importance of modeling also explains why memorization is such an important part of the classical education process, because I said that copy work is sort of the academic equivalent of, you know, watching your YouTube video. But memorization is another way of exercising that same sort of, quote unquote, watching. Memorization allows you to watch a great mm. author at work. And... Uh, memorization has gotten, of course, such a horrible reputation in education. My my least favorite phrase of all time is drill and kill. Like if you, mm. you know, if you keep repeating something, which is an important step in memorization, you're going to kill a child's interest. Or you hear a lot about rote memorization, which implies that when you memorize something, it doesn't go down below the level of like, you know, the top cells of your brain. Um, parroting is always mm -hmm. a bad thing in education. It just means you're repeating what somebody else said without any understanding. But memorization, that's not what memorization is for. Memorization is a way of taking the model into yourself and making it yours. 
Wow. Yeah. So if you think about different things that we memorize, it's not that you memorize every single in history class. It's not that you memorize every single date you've ever heard, but if you have a general timeline in your brain, you have something that you can attach information to. You, you learn something new and you know where it fits. You've got something in your brain that you can work with as you continue to learn. You can internalize as you're reading all of these great works, as you're writing and copying down sentences from great writers, you're memorizing without even really realizing it, the rhythm and the vocabulary in those sentences in context so that you can now use it because you've got the model, not just in front of you in that moment, but inside of you, you've internalized that model. Yeah. I mean, you can't really get, for example, you can't really get through a modern history course if you're an American without memorizing 1776, Mm -hmm. 1861 to 1865, 1914 to 1918, 1939 to 1945, right? So if you memorize those dates, that doesn't somehow stunt your understanding. It gives you these these benchmarks so that you Mm -hmm. can think about, okay, this happened in 1893 after the Civil War, before World War I, which are like these, and of course, there are more benchmarks than those. Those are just sort of like the really basic ones. Um, Then that allows you to sort of situate yourself, as it were, in history. It's a tool. It doesn't stop you from thinking. It helps you to think. Right. And for so many years, it was just a part of the learning process. If you think back to the Athenians, where we kind of get a lot of our ideas from Mm -hmm. classical education, memorizing epic poems was something that young boys would be doing on the regular. They'd be learning these stories. They'd be learning the the language, learning this rhythm by memorizing epic poems or Mm -hmm. moving forward. We already referenced, you know, masters of language like St. Augustine and Shakespeare Mm -hmm. started out by memorizing poetry. Well, and when you memorize poetry, Mm -hmm. you're not just memorizing a poem, you're memorizing words and phrases and right. rhythms. You're feeling right. rhythms. And you once you've memorized a poem with a certain rhythm, you can reproduce that rhythm with other words. That's creativity. Right. Taking this rhythm, this beautiful rhythm that so many other people have used and feeling so comfortable with it that you can put your own words to it. You can match your own words to that particular rhythm. You can take that vocabulary word and put it into your own sentence to express your own ideas about what a character is doing or what your idea about the world is. Uh, the more that you have in your mind, the more that's sort of at the tip of your tongue, as it were, the more right. Creative you can be. Right. And just to reiterate what you just said, thinking about Shakespeare, there's a historian named Michael Wood, and we'll have a link for this in the show notes, who said that Shakespeare was the product of a memorizing culture in which huge chunks of literature were learned by heart. This learning by rote, Wood wrote, offers many rewards, not the least a sense of poetry, rhythm, and refinement, a heightened feel for language. And so, like you said, we think of Shakespeare as this very creative writer. But he had to learn the model first. He had to memorize what came before him. Yep, yep, yep. It's it, you know, it's funny. I when I was working on the history of the ancient world, uh, which is the first volume in my world history series for for grownups and ambitious teenage readers, I was doing Assyrian history, and I just these you know these words kept coming back to my mind, which were. <laughs> The Assyrian came down like the wolf on the fold and his cohorts were gleaming in purple and gold and the sheen of their spears was like stars on the sea when the blue wave rolls nightly on deep Galilee. And if you don't know that, that's from the destruction of Sennacherib. By, it's, a, it's a poem by Byron. And I memorized that, I guess, at some point. And I probably had, mm-hmm. had it in, a, in one of those old McGuffey readers or something that I had memorized it. And in case you don't know, they all die. And here's what Byron writes about this. For the angel of death spread his wings on the blast and breathed in the face of the foe as he passed and the eyes of the sleepers waxed deadly and chill and their hearts but once heaved and forever grew still. So I'm writing about this particular battle and so much of this language came back to me and it really inspired me to make that chapter really vivid and mm. to write it almost more as like a like a movie scene, you know, where you could really see how devastating this battle was. And I mm-hmm. didn't realize until afterwards that, in fact, I was rewriting um, the destruction of Sennacherib <laughs> by Byron. But my editor, who had, a, you know, a classical education 
just did a quick note in the margin and said, I see that you've read Byron. (laughs) And I thought, oh, that's where that came from. So it just, it made that whole chapter so much more vivid because Mm -hmm. all of that language was in my mind and those scenes started to flash in front of me, you know, as though I could actually see and hear them. Right. You, by memorizing it, you internalized it and then it became your own in a new product. That's so cool. And up through the 1940s, students across the US were using readers like the McGuffey readers you mentioned Mm -hmm. and primers that encouraged a lot of memorization. For example, the 1927 course of study for elementary schools lists that first graders would be memorizing poems by Robert Louis Stevenson, um, by Charles Kingsley. Second graders were memorizing Tennyson and Lewis Carroll. And so this was a part of even our education up until more recently. And that's why I think I wanted to go through and debunk a few misconceptions about memorization because it's it's shifted in the last few years. I know I didn't do as much memorizing of poetry as I wish I had as a young mm-hmm. child. And we definitely didn't emphasize it when I was teaching. Yeah. So a couple of misconceptions, if we can humor me and go through. Sure. Number one being that memorization is opposed to critical thinking. It's either memorization or critical thinking. There, um, If you memorize something, you're not thinking about it for yourself. What are your thoughts on that? <laughs> well, you can't think for yourself until you memorize. Thinking for yourself mm-hmm. means that you have some, you know, grasp on what is agreed upon. I mean, most knowledge is shifting and up for grabs at any given time. But one of the ways in which we come to an understanding of what is true is we look at all of the work that other people have done and the evidence that other people have proffered and what they have found out and the arguments that they have made. We cannot think critically until we know what other people have done, because there's no way that we can sort through all of the information in the world and sort it out for ourselves. I mean, that that would be giving us super human powers. So taking in facts from other sources, always looking at where, you know, those sources got the facts and what their what their right. the basis is, of course. But taking in those and sifting through them and figuring out which ones are bedrock, which ones are foundational mm-hmm. is the only way that we can think critically. I mean, one of the things we say in the well-trained mind is you can't analyze the fall of Rome until you know when Rome started to decay, what that decay looked like, what the economic situation was, who was coming into the empire. Mm-hmm. Who you, we, you, There are a lot of facts that you need to memorize before right. you can wax philosophical about the fall of Rome. Right. There's an article about why memorizing stuff can be good for you in Forbes mm. that I'll link in the show notes. But there's this quote that I think is really powerful. Such a great piece. Many teachers don't even try to get students to remember information they can Google. They've mm-hmm. been trained to believe it's best to go straight for the quote, quote, higher order skills, like mm-hmm. analyzing and synthesizing, rather than wasting time on supposedly quote, quote, lower order ones like knowing and understanding information. But scientists who study the process of learning have found something quite different. The more factual knowledge people have about a topic, the better they can think about it critically and analytically. Uh So to me, what this says is memorization isn't opposed to critical thinking. It's the building blocks to critical thinking. It's absolutely essential to understand a topic and understand what people think about it and what the facts around it are before you can add something to the discussion or think about it for yourself. The more factual knowledge you have about scientific advances in the 19th and 20th centuries, the better you can think critically and analytically about, oh, I don't know, vaccines, for example. Not that we need to get (laughs) too off topic here, but maybe we'll do a whole season on things that make people mad. But, (laughs) But it's, yes, the more factual knowledge you have the more Mm -hmm. critical and analytical you can be. So yes, absolutely. Memorization, far from being opposed to critical thinking, memorization is the absolute ground of the ability Mm -hmm. to think critically. Right. All right. Let's move on to misconception two, which is people forget what they memorized. I forgot all the science terms I learned in high school already. So there's no value in the exercise. What are your thoughts? I think that we actually don't know very much about how memory works, Mm -hmm. to be honest. I mean, how many times? I mean, I'm I'm turning 55 this summer, so I'm older than you are, Susanna. But I have had things even just recently pop up from Mm. decades before 
that I couldn't have accessed if I'd been looking for it in my memory, mm-hmm. but came up when it was needed. So right. I I, th- I think that, oh, you just forget what you memorized. I think that that's a kind of a, um, it's almost an arrogant perspective mm-hmm. and that it assumes that if something isn't at the front of our brains all the time, then our brains will never recollect it. Oh, our, our brains are really deep wells. I mean, there is mm-hmm. a lot in there. I don't think right. anything that you put in that well goes to waste. I think it comes mm. back when it's needed. Yeah. And there are some things that we do use over and over again, thinking about math facts. I've said on here before that I didn't really learn my math facts that great until I was much older, but you use those all the time. Word sure. roots, basic formulas, that timeline of the world, those frameworks in your mind, you don't even realize you're using them when you're writing, when you're, when you're cooking, when you're going through life. I think we underestimate how much basic knowledge we learned as kids that we use on a regular basis. Absolutely. Absolutely. Misconception number three, our last one, memorization is boring, oppressive, and will kill your child's love for learning. What are your thoughts? That sounds bad. Um, It's just not true. (laughs) So so we have have talked before, and in fact, in a couple of the earlier episodes in this season, we've talked about how memorization is particularly appropriate for young children because they enjoy Mm -hmm. the repetition. And far from being oppressive and boring, the memorization is a wonderful challenge. But memorization remains valuable in middle and high school and all the way up, believe it or not, into adult life. So let's not get too hung up on what quote unquote memorization is. Mm -hmm. Memorization doesn't necessarily mean that you have to learn something word for word, say it perfectly. If you don't say it perfectly, you get punished or have to go memorize it some more and repeat it again. Mm -hmm. Sometimes memorization is actually just repetition. I think all of us have books that we read over and over and over and over again. And we couldn't, that's a form of memorization. We don't, we, we don't do that so that we can quote the books from beginning to end. But the rhythm, there's something in those books that speaks to us. Mm. It speaks to the way we express ourselves. It speaks to something that we know about the world or understand about the world. And the phrasings and the words and the ideas and the metaphors become part of how we think. And Mm. far from being something that kills our love for learning, it gives us words, tools, vocabulary, a way to understand and talk about the world. Far from being oppressive, it is freeing because anything that gives you tools to express yourself is freeing. Mm Mm. So what I'm hearing from you, which I think is really interesting, is this idea that memorization is more than just repeating the exact same word, but it's really internalizing information, internalizing facts about the world, internalizing great writing so that you can you have it as a source material to go through your life and use in different contexts. And that's such a beautiful way to look at it. That's exactly right. And when you think of memorization in that way, then writing summaries of a philosophical argument in your own words is a form of memorization because you're taking Mm -hmm. those ideas into yourself in a way that you can keep with you. Wow. That's great. And it doesn't have to be boring. For young kids, there's so many ways to make it fun from If you're memorizing the Declaration of Independence, you know, doing a performance or you're doing the Gettysburg Address, just put a big hat on your kid and let them be Abraham Lincoln, you know, to dad and the rest of the family or make it a game or make it a even using technology. We had a game called Quarter Mile Math where the more math facts you entered, the faster you did it, the faster your horse ran in a race. I mean, just little things like that. I was ready to do math for as long as I needed and I was not a math kid, but there's so many ways singing songs songs, you know, using props, making it a competition. There's so many ways to make learning information fun for kids. It does not have to be this horrible, you know, you just repeat the same words over and over again, drill type of thing. So Susanna, uh, before we close here in a minute, I'm going to put you on the spot, but I'm going to give you a minute to think about it. I I was, as we were, we were going through the outline for today, you know, what we were going to talk about. And I just thought about how many things that I have memorized and then have passed on to my kids have become sort of a lingua franca in our family, Mm -hmm. things that we just repeat over and over and over and over and over and over again. And uh, my youngest, so in a minute, I'm going to ask you if you can identify any of those for you. This summer, my my youngest daughter, she's getting ready to start her senior year at college. So this is her last big summer home. I know. And she's been here all summer. And she and I have been 
totally, this is silly. We've been totally stuck on the patter song from Rudigor. So <laughs> Rudigor, for those of you who may not know, is a Gilbert and Sullivan operetta. Gilbert and Sullivan wrote uh, The Pirates of Penzance and HMS Pinafore. Those are probably the best known ones. Rudigor is not maybe as well known, but there's what's called a patter song in it, which is where the characters, as fast as possible, go through this entire argument, as it were. And I'll just do a tiny bit of it, if I may. You may. My eyes are fully open to my awful situation. I should go once to Roderick and make an explanation. I should tell him I've recovered my forgotten moral senses and I don't give up and see for any consequences. Now I do not wish to perish by the sword or by the dagger, but a martyr man does a little pardonable swagger and a word or two of compliment my vanity with swagger, but I got to die tomorrow, so it really doesn't matter. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> it's awesome. also very it's also very hard to do on key. So when Em and I were we you know we were actually working together on the farm this summer, one of us will be like, you know, and the other will go, My eyes are fully open to my awful situation. And um, I don't there's just something lovely about having someone else's wonderful words there uh, to right. relate to each other. So I just right. offer that to you as a very silly example of how memorization has been fun for us this summer. Absolutely. I would say for my family, it's the entirety of the movie Sound of Music um, is <laughs> just a part of our daily vocabulary and phraseology um, and little things like you said, you know, if, if somebody in the family says, I want pudding, then everyone else does the voice and says, I want pudding. And I don't even know what that's from, but there's so many <laughs> things that my brothers introduced to me and you just do it. You just quote it and you've got it memorized and it's part of who we are as a family. <laughs> Maybe one of our wonderful listeners will identify the source of I want Someone pudding. Someone must know. I Someone mean, my brother know. said it and they were always teaching me things. I did everything they did. They were, <laughs> of course, my world. But well, wonderful listeners, please tell me, send me an email. We, we put this out to you. And if you'd like to send us an email telling you, telling us what you repeat in your family, then we'd love to hear that, too. Um, so we will have links to the different things we've discussed in our show notes. Please subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. We'd love to hear from you, not just about pudding and things like that, but also your thoughts on classical education, home education, school education, any kind of education that interests you. You can reach us at podcast at welltrainedmind.com. 